On this week's episode of the Players Experience Podcast, we chat with two-time Canadian Olympic swimmer Mark Tewksbury on his career in sport. What it was like to publicly come out as gay in the 90s, his message and his movement work with Special Olympics and the inclusion of the movement, and also to what it was like to be awarded the camp uh, companion of the Order of Canada just last year and what that recognition meant to him. Before bringing Mark on, guys, just remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel below so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And also, too, guys, we have discount codes with Hush Blankets, the Great North Apparel, and the Jaywalk, so make sure to take advantage of those codes with the player's experience in your uh, discount code at the end to get your discount. Player's Experience Podcast, coming up next. Hey Mark, how are you? I'm great, Ryan. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. It's been oh, it's a time and a bit since we last saw each other. I think the last time we saw each other was at the Special Olympics Canada Gala a few years ago. Um, how have things been since then? Uh, the world has changed. I look forward to seeing you at a gala again one day. Far, far away. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, well, let's just get into it. I like to open up every segment with a rapid fire segment. So I'm going to ask you four quick questions. I just want you to think of the first thing that comes to mind when I ask you that. Uh, so what's your favorite, favorite time of the day? My favorite time of day these days is actually sort of right as the sun goes down from four to six o'clock. I don't know why. Usually I, I dislike that time of day, but somehow being home all day, we like candles and it makes that transition from day to night really great. Sorry, I'm not being a very quick fire response. I apologize. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, strangest thing in your fridge right now. Oh, probably uh, some funky black bean paste that went into a delicious um, Chinese dish, but it's definitely a, a, a little bit funky. That's good. A uh, TV show that you're currently watching. You know, I should be able to answer this so quickly. And I even, you gave me this and I should have an answer ready. And I don't even, I'm watching so many things. My brain just shuts down. I'm going to say Coronation Street. It's, it's right. sad, but it's true. It's, a, it's sort of a soap opera out of the UK. Hey, trust me, my aunt made me grow, watch that growing up, so I get it. <laughs> Same people are still on it, Ryan. Same people are still on it. <laughs> <laughs> what other sport would you want to compete in outside of fast swimming? I wished I could have been a star tennis player. That would have been amazing. I'm a good runner, and I love cycling, but I, I, I'm really attracted to the sport of tennis. That's great. And you know what? That's a transition into my first question for you. And I want to learn, how did you get into swimming? Um. Well, the Olympics were on in 1976, and Canada had an amazing team. We won eight medals in the pool, and so as a little kid that knew how to swim, that was the sport that kind of spoke to me, because it was exciting, and we did well, and I knew how to do it. So those elements combined to lead me to joining a swimming club. That's fantastic, and you definitely had, have had such a decorated career, which we're going to get into, but you got to compete at your first Olympic Games in Seoul, South Korea in 1988, winning a silver medal as part of Canada's relay team. What was it like for you to experience uh, your first Olympic Games and get to see yourself on the podium? Yeah, so those are two different things. Um, the podium was a great experience, but I felt like I was the weakest link on the relay, and I felt like I kind of got pulled there. I had a very disappointing Olympics uh, individually. And, you know, I'd say the word would, overwhelmed would be the best single word to describe my first Olympic experience. I was overwhelmed at the enormity of the facilities, at the number of, of people in the athlete's village, at the size of the other human beings in different sports. So I was. it wasn't a great experience. Um, and also it was my first time in, in Korea uh, and very little time in Asia. So it was a bit of a culture shock. Uh, so lots of elements combined to not have a great Olympics for me. That's disappointing. But you know what? Just to make it to the Olympics is, a, is an accomplishment in itself. Um, obviously, you want to uh, be the best that you can be at these Olympic Games. But you ended up getting um, another chance at the Olympics four years later in 1992 in Barcelona following that silver medal performance. Um, earlier on in the 100 meter backstroke where you paired up with a uh, bronze medal um, as well as in sorry the four by 100 meter medley what was it your mindset going into those games 
um, and wanting to be better and ultimately walking away with uh, two medals, sorry, the bronze medal and then uh, the gold, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, gold in the 100-meter backstroke. Um, well, my mindset was completely different. Um, first of all, I, I didn't run the risk of not having been to Barcelona before the Olympics. So I made a point of, even though in our competition schedule it didn't bring us there, I did a trip. I went to see the facilities early. I became familiarized. Um, yeah, it was just a totally different experience. I was also much more realistically a medal contender not necessarily gold but it was i had a very very solid shot at getting a silver or bronze um the gold was a big surprise you know i dropped 1.2 seconds on the day and um everything just aligned in the moment and i, I had out touched the world record holder by six one hundredths at the wall so it was just one of those perfect perfect races on a, a great day that happened to be the olympics so it was really exciting that's fantastic now, throughout your appearance at the 88 Olympic Games, you competed four times at the Commonwealth Games as well, winning four golds there in the 4 by 100 meter medley and a 100 meter backstroke, uh, respectively. As well, you competed at the Pan Pacific Championships, walking away with five medals over the span of those four years as well. How much work and dedication went into those games while also trying to train and get your mindset ready for the Olympics? Uh, well, it's really kind of a pathway. It's all connected to each other and one builds on the next. And so it was just natural stepping stones on the way to the games. But I think what's really important is, um, you know, learning to win. So some of those competitions, the Commonwealth Games, uh, lots of great competitors, but not the intensity of the Olympics. Many much fewer countries. Uh, same with the Pan Pacifics. Again, some really excellent swimming countries, but not everybody. So when you get the used to getting on the podium, then you just want to keep doing it. And I think that rolls over to the Olympics. And it's funny you say earlier, you know, just being Olympian is a big accomplishment. And it's so true. But somehow, as, as the progression happens, you know, making the Olympics is great, but then you want to win a medal. And then when you medal, win a medal, you want to win a gold medal. And when you win a gold medal, you want to win another gold medal. So it, it, you, you, it, the perspective changes. And suddenly, you know, being Olympian, 100%, if you told me when I was 10, you're going to be an Olympian twice over, I would have been like, that's incredible. But it somehow gets shadowed by other things as you go along. Yeah, hey, I feel you on that. As you know, I'm an athlete with Special Olympics myself. I went to the 2014 National Summer Games out in Vancouver. Our team placed third, getting bronze medal in, in what was really a heartbreaking loss because we ended up um, losing the uh, the silver medal, like the game to go, or sorry, the semifinal yeah. pass, um, by a score of seven to six. And uh, it was so heartbreaking. So going, like wanting to kind of drive and feed that, that need for wanting to get a better medal, we ended up doing that four years later in 2018 in Nova Scotia. Um, where we ended up getting gold and, and also setting a record as the uh, the only team at a national game in a team sport to go undefeated at a tournament as well. Um, Amazing. So it's just, I, I understand that feed for the need or need for the feed, whatever you want to say it, and the steps up and the next level for sure. Yeah. First of all, someone's like, great, you made nationals. You're like, yeah, that's perfect. And then you win a medal. You're like, forget just making nationals. I want to win nationals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the next step after the nationals for, I know for Special Olympics is Worlds, which is basically exactly. the Olympics. So that's the exactly. Next. So that's, that's the next journey for me is to hopefully get to a world game before I uh, call it a career. Now, awesome. we, had, we had a fan question coming in um, asking, after competing, what do you do in terms of recovery and daily wellness? Are there any particular workouts or vitamins that you would help to, or sorry, you would take to help with your recovery process? Um. So I did take vitamins back in the day, but I've never been a big supplement fan. I, I, I cook. I like to eat well. I have a good diet. Uh, I did have to watch my iron. When I was training, my iron um, had a tendency to go low. And so I had to eat sometimes more red meat or things that were high in iron. Um, but post-career, I mean, listen, I just incorporated those good habits into my life. I, I like to exercise. I like functional fitness. I don't do a ton of, you know, just lifting weights for the sake of lifting weights. Uh, I like to do like burpees and push-ups and sit-ups and lunges and that kind of stuff. That, easy to do at home, easy to do in a hotel room, wherever you are in the, in the world. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I've never been a good sleeper, unfortunately, but that's just my cross to bear. <laughs> yeah, I know. Obviously, sleep's a big thing, but like, man, for you to be able to do burpees, dude, like, I can't even do one. Like, I can do one, maybe, but burpees were always like, 
They're hard. Like, even you know, my gym teacher at high school, when he's like, all right, guys, we're going to do te- 10 burpees right now. I'm like, dude, tell me. Like, they're so hard. <laughs> uh. Now, in, uh, in 1993, you and Mark LaDuke both gave interviews about your sexuality to a CBC radio series called The Inside Track. At the time, that interview was given anonymously, anonymously rather, sorry, but in 1998, you officially came out as gay. How important was it for you to come out and in some minds be criticized, but in others be looked at as brave and you willing to show your sexuality and show that really your sexuality shouldn't come out uh, or sorry, shouldn't result in outcomes in sport. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a very personal decision. Um, I had never imagined that I would actually do that, like speak so publicly about being gay, but it, it, it was just, there was something, you know, sometimes you live through a period of time. And so my own personal trajectory was one where I was feeling frustrated. I felt like I wasn't being honest and sincere and that just didn't really sit well with me. At the same time, the public consciousness was shifting. Um, People were being authentic, telling their stories. There seemed to be an appetite for that. And I didn't realize it, but, you know, sort of in being brave in that moment, um, I was rewarded for that many years later. You know, it was a tough thing at the time. I lost work. I faced all kinds of, you know, ugliness, uh, discrimination and backlash. And why do we have to talk about this? I was the first to kind of go there. But it was totally worth it. And and I'm grateful that for whatever reason, my life at that moment was ready to, to do that. And that subsequently it's over the past couple of decades, I think it's it's really helped shape the landscape in sport. It's it's for sure for sure got the discussion going, and I think changed the landscape a bit. It definitely has, and that discussion has certainly made such an impact in sport with so many individuals. Um, and t- and since that announcement, throughout the next fifteen years after that, you did a lot for the gay community, from being a panelist on the two thousand three. National Gay and Lesbian Athletics Conference to writing a book in 2006 titled Inside Out, Straight Talk from a Gay uh, Jock, and also being inducted into Canada's LGBT Human Rights uh, Hall of Fame in honor of your achievements and efforts to help end discrimination in sports. What was it like to be that advocate and, again, truly make a difference in the sports world for the LGBTQ community? Well, I mean, I was very lucky in that my advocacy was my sharing my story. And, and I met some incredible people all over the world that are really the, the heroes of advocacy. They're in countries where you can lose your life or go to jail for being openly gay or lesbian or transgender, or part of our community. And, you know, they're the real, real advocates and the, and the people out there fighting for rights. I was amongst them, alongside them, sharing my story, inspiring people, hoping to uplift, um, maybe give some hope, um, which is important too. But the heavy lifting, man, I, I, my hat goes off to the organizations in the world that really fight for human rights, because in some places it's uh, extremely difficult to be treated equally. No, for sure. And honestly, man, like, Good, kudos to you because um, I know like from an athletic perspective, um, it's always challenging to come out and, and talk about different topics that you're, you're unsure how they're going to be perceived, right? Um, mm-hmm. and, and it's so important to have these discussions and have these conversations um, continuously throughout your life and throughout other people's lives. And, and you never know, you could just be talking at, at another conference or another workshop about something but you don't know who's going to be in that audience to make that really big impact, right? And, and your words and your motivation could be that difference for that one person. Totally. And, you know, like, I just got this beautiful book that I think is targeted at school kids, and it features 10 uh, LGBTQ plus uh, community athletes, coaches from sport. And on the very first story, it says Mark Tewksbury, Canada's first openly gay Olympian, first out Olympian. And I'm hugely proud, you know, and to see, in a way, my story touches many stories after me in that book. And, and so I, I feel it. I've seen it. I've heard the impact. And I'm so grateful for it. But I'm also so grateful that my story is the past now. There's current people sharing their story that, the, you know, the story's evolved. And it's, uh, you know, I got it started, but now I'm kind of the, I, I, I'm the footnote, hopefully. And you're the, you're the opening chapter and now the chapters are endless. It just keeps going. And going. <laughs> that's a good way. Yeah, that's a nice way to look at it, right? 
Now, you're also a true champion of another movement, obviously the Special Olympics and the movement in Canada. You sat on up the board, you've attended the gala in the past, and as we said at the start, that's how we first met. How is it um, for you to be able to provide your message and your motivation with Special Olympic athletes and be part of the inclusion of that movement? Yeah, and I was also chair, I have to say, of the board of directors, especially over the 50th anniversary year. That was a very exciting time to be part of Special Olympics. I've been on the board for 12 years, if you can imagine. My term finally ends this September, which is time, but it's been amazing. Um, one of my proudest legacies is the Champions Network, the group of star athletes that come together to support Special Olympic athletes. It's been started in 2011. I can hardly believe it's been 10 years. Um, it's been great. I mean, I've always shared an affinity with Special Olympics athletes because I know what it feels like to be stigmatized over something about ourselves that's just who we are, we can't change it, um, to be excluded just on basis of us, you know, and I've, I think there's been great empathy and, and wanting to make a, an impact for the same reasons I wanted to make an impact for the LGBTQ community, for equal rights, for equal access, but Special Olympics has a like a special place in my heart because it uses sport for such a great outcome that you really see that sport transcends the physical sport and creates community and self-confidence and travel and all the things you've talked about and to me that's the best of sport so i think that special olympics in many ways exemplifies what sport can do to its best ability and it's so true because um i, I don't mean to like toot my own horn over here but like when i was in high school Believe it or not, I was the quiet kid in the corner. I didn't really have that many friends. I had like a good little like section of friends, but I was always like the the kind of odd kid out for the most part and, and things like that. And um, I joined up in 2006 with Special Olympics because my friend at the time from high school had said like, hey, do you want to come play baseball? Because he knew I had a passion for the sport and not knowing it was Special Olympics, I ended up joining in, in here we are 14 coming on 15 years in June that I've been with the organization as an athlete. It's uh, really changed. I know like my life because I've been able to be part of multiple number of competitions, but also being able to meet individuals in the movement, whether it's fellow athletes that I'm now really good friends with or individuals like yourself, where we can have a great conversation just like we are today about our sport, about our careers and about the legacy that we want to leave behind too. Right. Yeah, Special Olympics is majorly about inclusion, and I love inclusion. That's that's my that's what gets me excited. No, that's that's great. Now, um, talking more about your involvement in teams outside of your retirement um, after, or sorry, outside of your sport after you retired in 2010, you were named the chef de mission. If I said that right, of the 2012 Canadian Summer Olympic team, how excited were you to be part of that team, kind of on the other side, not competing but still being able to be present for? Yeah, I was magical. I'm, I'm super grateful that um, I applied and that I, I was able to be chef de mission. I, I had no idea how wonderful it would be back in the village. You know, I, I hadn't been in an Olympic village living in it since an athlete. And and it's even better than being an athlete because every day I had medal potentials. It's like every day I won medals during the games, not just my own. And But it was hard too. I mean, it, it's great to be there at the medal stuff, but lots of athletes – you know, it's very few that get to have that, that moment. Most have a tough go of it or didn't do their best or dream didn't turn out how they'd hoped. And I was also the first person there for a lot of those moments. So it was extremely emotional. After the 21 days I was on site, I was just like, I think I slept for a week when I got back to Canada. But I'll never forget it. It was, it was one of the most exciting experiences of my life. Now, what's the best part about the Athletes' Village? And be honest... I think um, the cafeteria, because it, it like it's so sophisticated now. When I when I competed in 1988, they there was no international foods. Uh, we kind of had to eat Asian food because that was we were in Asia. But now there's stations with everything you can imagine. You can have a Indian curry for breakfast. You can have a big English breakfast. You can have American bowl of cereal. You can there's even a McDonald's, which I I'm not impressed with in the Olympic Village. It's the most it's the busiest McDonald's in the world apparently when it's on, which what does that tell you about high performance athletes? But yeah. anyway, um so the food is really and just being in it, Ryan, just 
seeing the other athletes. It's, it's a very humbling experience and you, you feel a fabric of humanity. It's like a world games or nationals or, you know, when people come together from different areas and you actually see their people, you know, they're eating, they're, they're getting on a bus, their legs are tired. Like we're more alike than we are different is a, a great um, lesson that you take from the Olympics. And hey, with that McDonald's running there, they, they don't call cheat day cheat day for a reason, am I right? Exactly. It seemed like every day was a cheat day at the Olympics. <laughs> now, just last year, you were appointed as a companion in the Order of Canada, which is the highest civilian honor in Canada. First off, like, congratulations, sir, because that is fantastic. <laughs> Thank that you. you. I'm wearing my, my nice snowflake pin. Uh, you can tell companions it's got a red maple leaf. I'm so proud of that. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> No, and it's well-deserved. Um, you received it for your athletic excellence, sport leadership, champion, quality, equity, inclusion, and human rights, both on and off the field. What did it mean for you to receive uh, that award among your already kind of stacked list of accomplishments? Well, it's the, it's the big, big cherry maple leaf on the top. <laughs> it's, I mean, it meant a, a, an enormous amount to me just to be uh, in the order of Canada that you can be a member an officer or companion. So, uh, you know, to be a member is, is incredible to be a companion was very overwhelming. I, back to that word. I was totally overwhelmed and I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to say I, I, I couldn't stop myself from crying. It was very touching. That's great. Well, it's so well deserved. And uh, I know that there's only, I think it's uh, what, 165 active people at once that have that award in all of Canada. So it's a, uh, it's a tremendous award and, and definitely well deserved, sir. So congratulations again on that. <laughs> I'm going to let the sir thing stick because it's companion, but usually I'm like, don't call me, sir. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll stop calling you. All right, mister. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Now, my last question for you is, uh, throughout all of your experiences, um, through travel, through competing, um, and post-swimming career, um, I like to end off every show with a section called Words of Wisdom. So what words of wisdom or advice would you have that um, you would like to give to the next generation of athletes, whether they want to see themselves at the Olympics, or whether they just want to kind of be that next uh, champion in themselves? Well, I think I'm going to be inspired by Special Olympics, and I'm going to say, Remember the joy and share the joy because I think Special Olympics is great at sharing the joy of participating in sport and really like savoring the moment and loving being part of it. And I think the challenge with high performance sport is that sometimes as you go higher up the up the ladder, you get narrower in focus and it gets more intense and you can forget that fun and joy that it was back when you started. So that's going to be my, my final words of wisdom. Words of wisdom from the great Mark Tewksbury. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Um, hopefully, like you said at the start, we can get back to a gala in person sooner than later because uh, it would be great to see you again and catch up um, and all the best moving forward. Great. Nice to be part of your show, Ryan. Keep going. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Bye. No. No.